All right, starting at City Hall in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. I'm gonna go up Broad Street today. It's not, this is not Broad Street, but uh, I'm going to go to Broad Street and then skate south on Broad Street. Probably until either South Street or Washington, depending on um, how much talking I have to do. Uh, like, meaning how many things I have to say before I run out of stuff and start making things up. So, what I want to talk about today is uh, what technical means in Jiu Jitsu. So somebody says, hey, you're real technical. Uh, or that person is super technical. That can mean a lot of different things. I think in some cases, what people mean by that is that somebody knows a lot of techniques. They know a lot of, um, you know, from closed guard, they know like 50 different moves, a lot of different variations of, you know, I don't know, flower sweep arm bars, whatever. So, meaning like breadth of technique, number of moves. Um, I tend to think of technical as able to efficiently solve problems within the techniques that you use. So, for example, I don't think that having a lot of techniques makes one technical necessarily uh, as much as the ability to execute those techniques efficiently with low energy. So let's break that down a little bit. Um, I know people who know a lot of techniques, a lot of ways to do things, a lot of different moves. And I know people that are, and you know, they would be considered technical. I know a lot of people that don't do very many techniques. Some people that do maybe like two techniques, but they do them with a real depth of knowledge and level of efficiency. So they've dug super deep into that well of technique. And so I think both cases, breadth and depth of technique, are acceptable definitions for technical. I don't think, I tend to favor depth of technique, but I think that might just be a personal bias. Um, what I mean by depth of technique, depth of technique could be somebody who I don't know, let's say somebody who does a uh, stacking guard pass, for example, and that's their main thing when they're on top. And then when they're on bottom, they try to find sweeps that lead them into their stacking guard pass. And so becoming technical in that position, even though it's just really one move from bottom, one move from top, um, becoming technical would be the ability to perform that technique with low energy costs consistently against experienced people and an ability to solve the problems you come across while you're trying to do the technique. That guy's pretty cool. He does haircuts in the middle of the street. Um, so let's break that down even further, right? So we have, what is efficiency? I think of efficiency as if you have X amount of energy to use and the task requires, I don't know, Y amount of energy to perform, then you're able to use the least amount of energy possible to finish a technique. And so what that means is like, we've all rolled with people who do a move and it seems like they're gonna have, you know, a stroke trying to do the technique. They're straining so hard. You can see their, their arms are shaking, their legs are shaking, they're so tense, using a ton of muscular effort. That costs a lot of energy. There's people who use a lot of movement and uh, use way more movement than is necessary. That costs a lot of energy. There's people who use a ton of aggression when they really don't need to use that much aggression. And that also costs a ton of energy. And so to me, efficient technique is the ability to perform technique while reducing those three outputs. Physical energy, so like muscular tension, uh, explosion and speed and aggression. And so what does somebody who is technical replace those things with? Uh, so somebody who I think is technical would replace as much muscular tension as possible with skeletal alignment, using muscle groups that can support the movement easily over muscle groups that really struggle to support the movement, body weight, body positioning. So I think replacing muscular effort 
with skeletal linemen, big muscles versus small muscles, and uh, body weight, and where you put that body weight, is kind of a good way of looking at that. And like, it's impossible to completely replace strength with, you know, pure technique, leverage, whatever. There's always gonna be some amount of physical tension that's necessary and some amount of strength that's necessary in grappling. But I think you can sort of dial down the, um, the unnecessary strength element or the expensive strength and dial up the more efficient ways of doing things. Uh, second, speed and explosiveness, which also costs a fair amount of energy. I think you can replace or at least like substitute speed and explosiveness with timing. So for example, I have a friend who I've trained with for a very long time and he is not a huge guy, but um, he's actually a little bit shorter than me. Maybe I think I weigh probably 15 pounds more than him. I'm about 165, so he's probably like 150 or something, 155, maybe 5'5". Five, five. Um, and I've, as long as I've known him, I've heard people talk about how quick he is when he rolls and how fast he is and how it's hard to, you know, hard to catch him. And I don't really think that's true. I think he has a almost supernatural sense of timing in his, uh, in his A-game techniques and his best jiu-jitsu. I think he moves at the right time, which gives the appearance of him being fast or unnaturally quick. It's kind of the same thing with the strength thing that I was talking about. People who, people who feel super, super strong on the mat sometimes aren't actually that physically powerful. Like their muscles aren't able to exert some supernatural amount of force. It's just that they're able to put their body in such a position and make the best use of their alignment and a small amount of muscular effort and their body weight that it amplifies the strength that they do use. It makes them feel like they're way stronger than they actually are. Um, and I think it's the same thing with timing. I think if you do, a, if you do any action, any physical action at the right time, you could almost seem like you're teleporting around your partner. Like let's say you're trying to do a guard pass and like let's say your partner's playing butterfly guard and you do a cartwheel pass or a Toriano pass, if you time it exactly right, it can almost seem like you teleport past their guard. Yo, what's up, Mike? How you doing, buddy? Good, I'm making a walking tour. This is Mike. See you, bud. Um, oh, yeah, yeah, so it can almost seem like they, uh, like you, like they teleport past somebody's guard. And that's because they moved at the right time. What does it mean to move at the right time? Uh, that sensation of seemingly teleporting into a position or past somebody's guard or to somebody's back or into a guillotine, that comes from, it comes from moving when your partner is unprepared to move. And what I mean by that is there's times where you do an action and your partner knows you're gonna do the action and they're well prepared to deal with that action. They have a stable base, they have uh, their arms and legs in an athletic position that's ready to act at any moment. And then there's times where you're able to apply misdirection or off balancing, which then reduces their ability to react to your movement, right? And that's physical, physically slowing somebody down. Uh, the bait and switch, the uh, misdirection is also, and the off-balancing is also a way of mentally slowing somebody down. Um, acting at a time where they are not mentally agile. And agility meaning the ability to move in any direction with stable base, stable footwork, stable body positioning at a moment's notice. So if you can off-balance somebody, or you can create a, uh, a misdirection or a bait and switch. You can give the impression, you can, you can reduce somebody's ability to clearly see what you're doing 
and react to it, you can decrease their mental agility by the off-balancing or the misdirection action. And so when you try to do an action, you try to attack somebody who is all prepared both mentally and physically for what you're doing, it makes you seem slow and easy to catch, easy to deal with. If you can off-balance them or create misdirection, then you slow, you effectively slow somebody down, both physically and mentally. And you can make yourself, at the same time, seem way faster than you actually are. So it's that sense of timing, which is supported by misdirection and off-balancing. You're making yourself move at the correct time, and you're making your opponent, physically and mentally, act and react more slowly than they normally would. And that gives the impression of you being very, very fast, when in reality, you just slowed them down. Uh, if we go back to the strength thing also, with strength, this, you know, this is actually the same concept. If you can make your training partner, opponent, whatever, weaker, then you also feel physically stronger than you actually are. So you can maximize your strength by misaligning your partner's skeleton, putting them in an off-balanced and unstable position. And so it's sort of a similar idea physically. If you can misalign their body or off-balance them and take them out of an agile, athletic state, you can make yourself feel physically stronger than you actually are. And it's the same thing with speed. So um, just some ideas to think about. Uh, aggression. Aggression is the third costly element of, um, of jiu-jitsu. And so when you're aggressive, it kind of insinuates that there is an emotional component to what you're doing. Like maybe anger or, I don't know, ferocity. I guess anger kind of covers it. There's like that, you know, heat of anger in your, in your movements. And the thing about emotions is that those two are also emotionally costly. And for a lot of people, they're physically costly as well. Expensive, it's an expensive emotion. When you get mad, I, at least when I get mad, I get real tired afterwards. But the upside to aggression and having some sort of like emotional fire to what you're doing is that you get stuff done. It gives you, it gives you motivation. It gives you, uh, it gives force to the actions that you're doing. And so how do you still accomplish that in a more efficient way that doesn't cost you a ton of energy? And I think, I think what you're looking for there is to replace your aggression and that emotional component of anger with uh, assertiveness and almost like a, like a predatory sense of calmness when you're when you're doing your jiu-jitsu. It's still it's still sharp and it's still assertive and you're still proactive and you're still hunting your partner and offensively trying to do your actions to them, but it's without that expensive emotional component to it. There's willpower to it, but it's not that wild fire of aggression. It's uh, more like a like a like a laser-like focus, if that makes any sense. So so that's the act of taking the emotional component out and replacing it with calm, predatory assertiveness and uh, laser focus. And all of these things take time and experience to develop. And some people develop them naturally over time. But I think if you focus on these elements and actively try to pursue building those skills, it's something that you can cultivate and earn in your jiu-jitsu and your grappling a lot more quickly. And it also, you know, I guess the, another point about, uh, about the emotional thing, anger, is one of the problems with having an emotional component to your jiu-jitsu is that, you know, uh, anger can get out of control real quick. And uh, I think that's really, you know, really the crux of why it's a problem. If you, if you use that fire of being angry, then it's very easy for that fire to get out of control and burn you up, and make you exhausted. Uh, whereas assertiveness is a much cooler, much cooler, cooler burn, um, a lot more steady, and it doesn't tend to get out of control. You can overdo it a little bit, but it's a lot less, 
a lot less dangerous than getting angry or overly aggressive when you roll. The other thing about being assertive and you know focusing more on a calm assertiveness is that you can generally see more when you're rolling. Whereas with aggression, again, because there's that emotional component, you tend to get you tend to get kind of myopic where you can just only see what you're what you're hunting for, but you might miss opportunities that present themselves otherwise. So that's another reason for that. So I guess to kind of recap, uh, rather than, if, if we're talking about technical and what technical means, whether you are technical in a broad array of techniques or you've just dug super deep into you know, a relatively few bag of techniques and you decided to go with depth instead of breadth on a technical level, I think replacing the energetically costly elements of um, muscular tension, speed and explosiveness, and aggression with the other elements that I mentioned is a, is a better way to make yourself more technical. So what does that look like? How would you, how would you do that? Well, if you were trying to use less muscular effort when you're rolling and use more of your skeletal alignment and your body weight and body positioning to get the same job done, then one way you could do that is practice um, decreasing the amount of tension that you use when you're rolling. So for example, this is especially good if you're training with people that you have some sort of physical advantage over. So let's say I'm training with somebody that I'm bigger than, way bigger than, maybe stronger than. One thing that I can do to still get great training, but also improve my sense of um, my sense of technique and body weight distribution and uh, physical alignment is to just force myself to use as little energy as humanly possible when I'm rolling with them. So how can I still get the exact same job done? How can I still sweep, pass their guard, get to the mount position, but using as little muscular tension as possible and holding myself strictly to that stand when I'm rolling. So for example, if they start to get somewhere on me, instead of turning up the energy that I use because I just can't bear the thought of losing my position, I hold myself honest to that standard of using very low muscular effort when I'm rolling with them. And that helps me develop my body positioning, my skeletal alignment, and my weight distribution. All of which cost relatively less energy than sheer muscular effort. Uh, you start working your way up the food chain. So people that maybe are the same size as you, uh, but with less experience, right? And so you start looking for more and more challenging roles that you can apply that same thought process. So can I roll with, you know, maybe a, a strong purple belt my size and still hold myself to the same standard? And then once I am able to do that, can I, can I hold myself to that same standard doing that against a bigger, stronger, faster purple belt? And then going up the experience, the size, and the strength uh, food chain, so to speak. Um, and again, it's, it's just keeping yourself uh, strictly held to that standard when you're doing it. And, you know, avoiding that temptation to like turn the energy up and break your own rules. And uh, there's a certain amount of humility that has to come along with that because when you do that and you're learning how to train like this, you are going to eat some shit. preserving the ego and having to win at the cost of your training objectives. Um, another useful metric for doing this, or another useful way of doing this that gives you a, a sort of metric to work with is if you're training with somebody, you know, your experience level, and you're able to like, let's say, pass their guard, right? you can pass their guard two times in one training session. 
then hold yourself to the standard of can I get the same exact job done using 25% less energy? Maybe squeezing my grips a little bit less hard, um, clamping a little bit less hard with my lats when I'm doing pulling motions, etc. And so see if you can get the same job done with 25% of the energy spread and see what that looks like. And if you're able to do that, then try it with 40%, 60%, etc. And keep on working down from there. So trying to maintain the same level of um, effectiveness, but uh, increasing your efficiency by reducing your physical tension doing that. And it's the same idea when you're trying to improve your timing, for example. So if there's something that you usually do that requires you to move in fast, athletic, explosive bursts of energy, then can you get the same job done, but with 25, 30% less energy? Can you move a little bit slower? Can you move, can you find a slightly better time to do it? Can you find a way to off balance with your partner so they move a little bit slower? Can you find a time where maybe your partner is not quite as aware of what's happening um, and then attack during a time when they're not paying attention or when, when they're less aware? Can you create that lack of awareness by off balancing them, by distracting them, by creating an attack that forces them to sink in one direction and then you attack in the other direction? Things like that. So mentally slowing them down and then physically slowing them down by the same off-balancing, misdirection, um, combining techniques together. And so there'll be another way of working towards more efficiency by reducing your, uh, reducing your costs of speed and explosion. And then the last one with aggression, can you get the same job done by staying calmer? And can you be assertive and still impose your game on your, on your partner and still apply your game willfully against your training partners, but without that emotional blood pumping, heart racing sort of intensity and aggression that you might have. So can you turn that fire down and instead of having this sort of raging fire that burns through your opponent's guard, can you apply like a cooler, icier sort of intensity to your training? And I think all three of those elements kind of feed into each other, to tell you the truth. So I think the more you're able to apply that sort of cool assertiveness to your jiu-jitsu, the more you're going to be able to see opportunities to attack better. So you're going to improve your timing because you're going to have a clearer vision of when to attack, how to attack. Uh, you'll more likely be able to sense when your training partners are unprepared for you to attack them or when they're distracted or when they're thinking about something else. Um, and I think at the same time too, it'll help with your ability to apply less muscular effort in your training, maybe squeeze it a little bit less hard on your grips, um, putting your body weight in a more intelligent place, aligning your body in a specific way to create a cage around your partner instead of you having to hold and pull and squeeze. And I think all that comes from, again, having that cool assertiveness that gives you a broader vision when you're rolling. You can see and feel the opportunities for action much more clearly when you're when you're cool and assertive and composed. Um, and again, this is for the chess game of jiu-jitsu. So, I guess in a way you could say that that, uh, that assertiveness, that cool predatory assertiveness is sort of the, the key, key element to all of that. Without being cool and assertive, it's going to be way harder to physically relax and use less tension. It's going to be way more difficult to see opportunities to act and improve your timing. Um, so I think the master element there is this sort of cool assertiveness. When I say predatory, I always feel kind of funny saying predatory because it sounds sort of gross, like, um, I don't know, like that TV show to catch a predator. I don't mean predatory in that sense. I mean, 
predatory in the sense that like when you see animals in the animal kingdom like i don't know and not to get too like national geographic about it but you know when you see a jungle cat stalking some sort of i don't know like an animal or something like that it's not like they're sitting there like freaking out bristling with intensity um before they you know before they attack the animal it's more that they're highly alert they're in a very sense that when you're rolling you want to feel as if you're hunting or stalking your your partner uh, rather than you being a prey you want to make yourself feel as if you're you're coming after them and you're uh, how do I say this you're coming after them and they're the ones being chased and they're the ones that have to worry about what you're gonna do and there's a certain element of uh, confidence that is part of that, um, and that comes along with that. I think that's why people use so much animal imagery in martial arts. I think it's to convey that predatory sense. Um, it just, it sounds so corny though, you know? So it's, it's hard to like, it's hard to talk about it and find a way to discuss it without, you know, making it sound too cringy. But I think y'all get what I'm saying. Just let me know, and I'll be happy to discuss whatever. Alright, have a good one.